Hello and welcome to Data Basic, a Warwick Data Science Society podcast aimed at making data science simple and accessible. I'm Jakubas Smith, a third year MathStat student, and in this episode we have the pleasure to welcome the head of data science and engineering at Walgreens Boots Alliance, Simon Prynne. Simon has been working with the company for 23 years and he'll share his wisdom regarding how data science teams work together. Later, we'll run through a brief history of data science in industry with a segment hosted by our new producer, Anna Blanco. She'll cover data science from its inception to our current era of big data. After first going into accounting, Simon found that it wasn't quite for him, enjoying the commercial aspect, but not the practice itself. Taking a detour, he completed a degree in human ecology, which he enjoyed for being more multidisciplinary. He then worked for Stockport Council, analysing census data, before looking at other positions using data to solve problems. Um, I hadn't particularly set out to, to, to have a job, a, a career in, in, in analytics, but I found that I was just really interested in it. I found I was quite good at it. And I found that I was really interested in making a difference with data. And so once I really got into that, that's what led me to start to scan the market for what, what other kind of work might there be in that kind of area. And it was at that time there was a, um, an advert for boots and the advantage card scheme had not long been launched um, and they were looking for people to start to you know, look into that data and see what we could kind of learn from it and how we can improve the customer experience from that so I thought that sounds fantastic you know why don't I have a go at that so went for an interview really liked the people who I met and they seemed to like me as well and um, that, that got me into boots so, so I became an advantage card analyst about five six months after the scheme had been first launched um, that basically took me into, into commercial analytics. And so from that point, I've then done various kind of um, analysis, development analyst roles. I worked in IT for three years as the, um, the link between IT and the marketing and trading functions, um, helping to build up their kind of um, customer analytics capability. And then came back out of IT into real analytics again. So that was um, firstly macro space analytics. So that's how you optimize the store's footprint. And then location analytics, where to put the stores in the first instance. I was then asked to start to do the same sort of thing internationally. And then ultimately to the point where I am now where I lead um, the data science and engineering. So when Simon started, it was all about customer analytics. But over time, they realized the value of data in all their departments. So we spoke about the structure of the organization and how his team fits in with it. Within um, my team, we're part of what would be referred to um, as the hub of um, data analytics. So, um, it's, and that's a kind of a global hub. So um, there's my team in the UK. There's also the other part of um, the, the department I work for is in the, in the US. We're part of this kind of global data hub. So we will um, create models and productionize them for others across the whole of WBA to use. Elsewhere in WBA, there will still be other um, data scientists who will work in other teams, but they won't necessarily create kind of production ready um, capabilities. We will we may co collaborate with them on something which they've started to make. We will then help to kind of scale it up um, and industrialize it. That's the kind of the kind of way of working. But certainly the the sorts of work um, that we do, the types of department we can support, they they range now from um, everything from you know customer personalization, marketing, trading, through to logistics, location. Um, you know we even started to pick up a piece of work just uh, yesterday around. Um, kind of um, telecoms network networking and how we kind of create some sort of um, data science and visibility and visualizations around that kind of thing. So as, as I say, essentially, where, where there are large data sets, um, you know, we can help to, to investigate and help them help to, to surface the data, help to show what that data actually means, and then help to make a difference with it. In the current age of data science, there are many clearly defined roles, but it wasn't always this way. Imagine a restaurant kitchen where everyone was responsible for everything. That just doesn't happen now in established restaurants. And over time, data science has been moving towards this model of specialization. But now the challenge is how to get everyone working together effectively and how to structure your teams. The way they work together can vary. So and it depends upon the type of work. So we'll have some people who, who support um, specific processes within WBA. And typically, they they work within their kind of you know their chain of command, their line. Um, so they will work within a team of people who do essentially the same role as they do. We then have others who are working on um, projects, and in that instance, we we'll, we will often work in squads. So a squad might be um, squads from within my department, but it might have a combination of <clears throat> a, a data scientist, a senior data scientist, a senior data engineer, 
a team manager and so on. Um, so we have that kind of way of working. And then also we might well embed somebody into a squad which actually spans across into other departments. So you might have a squad that's based on somebody in marketing, somebody in training, somebody from my team, et cetera. And so how do you form a data science team? How do you know who's right to bring on? And once they have been brought on, how do you embed them into the company? My experience of this, I, you know, I really kind of like to sort of to, to look back on it and think how it kind of came about because I think it comes into the, the bit about diversity again in terms of diversity of skills. So there was a time, you know, way, way back, I don't know how long it was, quite a while. And I was in a team of uh, things. We had three, three data scientists. And we weren't called data scientists at the time. We were probably called senior analysts at the time. But essentially data science. And, um, and then one of, the, one of the team left. And they were the, the relatively more technical um, in terms of sort of IT technical in the team. And so, you know, myself and my colleague, we, we sort of thought about it. Thought, well, do, we, do we try to find somebody who's the same as us? And this was in, back in the context of us doing a lot of space optimization work. We thought, do we, do we look to find somebody who's the same as us? Or do we go for something completely different? Somebody who's much more kind of technical in an IT sense. And we decided, well, you know, we already know enough about the whole space optimization kind of analytics. But what we don't know is all that kind of back end kind of stuff. So why don't we find somebody who really knows the back end stuff, but maybe hasn't done any space analytics whatsoever? And it felt like a real leap of faith at the time. Um, you know, we, we weren't even managing the team. We were just asked to recruit a colleague to our, to our own team. So it felt like a real leap of faith, but it's, but it's what we did. We've, we got in essentially what became our first data engineer and it made a massive difference to what we could do because suddenly we could really scale up what we were doing. We could automate a ton of what we were doing. We could put front ends on what we were doing. We could scale things up. We could do things in multiple countries, etc. And I think that was that first step in my mind when I kind of think back in, in time to the, the birth of what became you know, my sort of data science and en- engineering team because we married the engineering bit with the data science pen. And, and I think what then happens is as you um, as you get more, as the team gets bigger, you then start to kind of focus on some of the kind of um, specific skill sets as well. So it's not just about having data scientists and data engineers. And I think a, a really useful um, article, which I would recommend to you um, and to your society, is um, it's a Forbes article on the five roles that every data science team must have. And it really kind of out, outlines this idea of, you know, Within your team, you need to have, you know, it, and it talks about it in the, in the context of, you know, imagine you're sort of doing building a house or something. So you need to kind of, your data scientist, per se, who essentially it's a bit like the kind of building services engineer, the person who designs all the central heating and all that kind of thing in the house. You need your information designer, who's like an interior designer, so the person who's going to create all the kind of nice looking front ends and can really help you to get to, you know, how, how visualization should work. Um, you need your machine learning engineer, who's a bit like the civil engineer, who basically makes sure the whole kind of building sort of stands up right at the back end, the front end, all that kind of stuff. You need a, a, a manager, basically like a foreman, to make sure it all works. But then fundamentally, you need this, this data translator, who's like the architect, the person who understands the vision of the person who wants the house, or understands the vision of the person whose business it is, or whatever it is, and, and understands how to kind of build, bring all that together. So I think... You know, as, as I've got to have, you know, a, a much bigger team now, that's the kind of thing I have in mind. So although we're called data science and engineering, there's actually sort of multiple different variants that we have within that team. So we have people who I would say are maybe pure data scientists, people who are pure data engineers. But we also have people in that kind of translator role. We have people in that information designer role, people who are sort of closer to the um, to the business in terms of the close to the, those relationships. And some who are kind of further away, much more kind of technical in the background. And we've got... I think um, sort of domain knowledge as well. So, um, you know, we have specific domain knowledge in space and range and location optimization, personalization, logistics, etc. And so you have this kind of lots of different kind of types of skill set, numerous different kind of domains that that skill set is applied to. But it's that bit that as you, as you expand the team, you have that opportunity to get ever more kind of... Um, you know, specific and almost extreme skill sets, which again, as long as that kind of respect is there within the team, you can really sort of harness all that. All that. So, yeah, I, th- I think that's probably the way I would say um, the, the team, how, how, how to build a team. I guess each, each, each different organisation will have its own, its own method and each, each different kind of, you know, team leader will have their own idea. But I think that's, for, for me, I think it was that bit of, it, as, as a team expands, when you have that opportunity, it 
it's how do you sort of try to find somebody who isn't just um, just the same as all the people who, who are already there or just the same as the person who they're replacing. But you take an opportunity to get somebody different who makes some kind of unique contribution. So you spoke about translators and people being closer to the business. How important is it for data scientists to have this business acumen or understanding of what's going on around them in the wider business? I think it's pretty key to have a, have a sense of, you know, other departments, how they run, where, where's it working and so on. I think it's, you know, it, it may be perfectly possible to, to carve out a niche for yourself as being a very pure and purest data scientist. And, and that is what you do. And people come to you with a very specific question. But I think the reality is um, it's, it makes more sense. And it's probably more sensible to be prepared to um, adapt and to, to build an understanding of, of what happens around you. I think the best um, outcomes that I've ever seen have, have come from people who they haven't necessarily used the most kind of um, complex technique, but what they've done is they've understood the, the context that they're trying to land that technique into. They've understood the people, they've understood the relationships, they've understood the processes, the challenges, and, and so on. And ultimately, they've landed something which might not be the, the theoretical optimal, but it's the practical optimal. You know, it's, it's a thing which it was possible to do in that context with those people in that scenario. And it's, and it's, um, and it's driven value. So, yeah, that, so I, I would say it's, it's vital to kind of, um, for anyone kind of going into the, the, the job market to, yes, have their, have their own kind of skill set, but be immediately ready to um, embed themselves into, into a business to really understand what, what makes it tick. This is a podcast about data science. But as Simon pointed out, what we know today as data science would have been downright magic just 30 years ago, which begs the question, where did this all suddenly come from? When did data science stop being used in industry? And who was the first to see the value in analysing data? Humans have been collecting data for over 20,000 years. We have records of Paleolithic tribes people from 18,000 BC marking sticks and bones to tally up trading activity or supplies. They would then be able to use this to make rough estimates of when their supplies would run out. Thousands of years later, we would make huge data stores like the Library of Alexandria, said to contain all knowledge the humans had learned up until then. By the 1600s, we had developed methods to not only store data, but also to analyse it. In 1663, records of deaths in London were being used to give warning signs about the spread of the bubonic plague. But it wasn't until 1865 that data analysis was recognised as a valuable tool in business. The term business intelligence was used to describe how a banker analysed data in a consistent manner to gain advantage over his competitors. As more and more data was recorded, we found ourselves producing it faster than we could analyse it. This came to a head in 1880, when the US Census Bureau estimated that it would take them eight years to go through all the information they had collected. A young engineer came up with an ingenious solution to cut that time down to only three months. He used a tabulating machine that used punch cards to automate the computations. Later, he would take this idea and go on to found his own computing company. We now know this company as International Business Machines, or IBM. From here on, innovation in the data world skyrocketed. By 1970, a mathematician from IBM created relational databases, which allowed different types of data to be linked together in a standardized way. Crucially, you no longer needed to understand the eternals of data storage, which removed the requirement of a PhD in electroengineering to work with data. This really excited the MBA graduates. Suddenly, software for analysing commercial and operational performance started emerging, and with the decreasing cost of hard disks, which acts as digital data storage, the possibility of data warehouses to store more and more data became clear. Then, a breakthrough happened in 1994. Dunhumby was a company founded by a husband and wife duo working out of their kitchen. The retail chain Tesco, which was second in the UK, asked them to find a way to capitalise on the potential gold mine of data they were sitting on. The loyalty card that the couple designed recorded what customers spent and when. While limited, this allowed Tesco to see where the competitors were winning and where Tesco had the upper hand, how far people were willing to travel and which customers spent the most. Tesco could then use this information to nudge customers towards more profitable spending behaviours. After trials in 1994, the company presented their findings to Tesco's board and in response to their findings, Tesco's then chairman Lord McLaurin said, what scares me about this is that you know more about my customers after three months than I know after 30 years. 
The term big data first appeared in 1999, and in 2001, an employee from Gartner described what would come to be its defining characteristics, volume, velocity, and variety. There was a lot of data to store and process, the stream of new data was constant, and was collected from a pool of sources such as GPS data and posts on social media. Data science was really catching on, but it truly became mainstream when Netflix announced in 2006 that it was setting up a million dollar prize if anyone could improve its movie recommendation algorithm by more than 10%. For three years, thousands of budding data scientists tried and failed to reach the mark, until in September of 2009, two teams joined forces to create an ensemble model that combined the strengths of both of their works. They achieved an improvement of 10.06%, collecting the million dollars. Just a year later, the executive chairman of Google announced that as much data is now being created every two days as was created from the beginning of human civilization to the year 2003. Naturally, everyone wanted to analyze their data to get as much insight from it as possible, but doing so is very expensive if you have to buy the hardware yourself. This was, and is, the reason behind the success of cloud computing. Instead of buying expensive hardware, you can now run the computing power from a company like Amazon, who set up Amazon Web Services in 2006, followed by Microsoft Azure or the Google Cloud Platform. These platforms not only reduce cost, but also help in areas such as efficiency and scalability. With cloud computing, teams in different locations working on the same data no longer have to store multiple copies of it, reducing storage waste. And also, instead of ordering mechanical parts to speed up computation, you can press a few buttons and, just the meme foretold, download more RAM. In fact, you're not even limited by what any single computer is capable of. With distributed computing, you can spread the workload over multiple computers. People in business might throw around the phrase the cloud without really knowing what it is. But for those who do, it truly is a revolution. There's an art to management. I've been lucky enough to have worked under a host of different managers, most of whom I've enjoyed working with. Sometimes you might find yourself in a leadership position, in group projects at university, for example. I think going through this gave me more of an appreciation for what it's like working with managers and being one myself. Now to me, the ideal team is one where the team trusts the manager and their direction, and the manager trusts the team to complete the work to a high standard. But of course, not every team can be like that and every manager has to start somewhere. I think you know, my experience of managing teams, when I first managed teams, um, I think I probably fell into the trap of being a little bit too kind of um, directive. And, you know, I wanted to kind of try and make a difference to every single thing that was happening all, all the time in, at a really kind of you know, individual kind of level. Um, and I think over time, as you know, I, I did more managing and I was managing bigger teams, it started to get to a point where it's not so much you're trying to manage individuals, you're trying to manage the environment in which those individuals are, are working. Um, so, you know, my focus becomes more on, um, you know, am I sort of, am I creating the right kind of culture? Am I creating the right kind of profile prospects for my team with senior stakeholders? Um, you know, is the, is the funding that we need available? Um, are we getting the right kind of support that we need from other kind of support functions? Um, am I, encouraging people to sort of to talk and share ideas enough and I think that's probably just a generic thing that you'd apply across you know a big team but certainly that's my sense of what I've kind of learned over, over time to do in terms of managing a team. In terms of you know managing data scientists and uh, data engineers you know would it be is it any different from managing another type of um, skill set? I don't know really I think um, it seems to me that what people in sort of data science and data engineering want to do is they want to be able to investigate. They want time to investigate. They want the time to, you know, to do something right. They want to, they want time to do something wrong as well. You know, work out what doesn't work, work what works, work out what works a little bit better, a lot better, and so on. Um, you know, communication is required. I think the other one of the key things I think is important in, in managing a team like this is uh, sort of, you know mutual respect across the whole team. I think it comes into the diversity bit as well. So the, the, the bigger the team you have, the more diverse you can you can make it in, in, in terms of lots of different things. You know, that could be um, that could be in terms of specific skill sets. It can be in terms of, you know, personal traits like, you know, introversion, extroversion, all that kind of stuff. And you can go for a really diverse team and get all the benefits of that if you have um, mutual respect all the way through that team. If, if 
on the other hand, you have kind of, you, you, you allow kind of cliques to form. Oh, you know, this type of person doesn't like that type of person. And all the, the that, that drains the diversity. So I think that's probably one of the key things of, you know, having a, having a big team of specialists and those specialists themselves having their own specialisms. The thing which kind of holds it together and gets the most value out of it is if you, if you have a culture where everyone kind of respects the other's input, even though they don't necessarily agree with it or fully understand it. And when you spoke about managing an environment, can you share with us um, something that you found is particularly successful for managing an environment, a technique perhaps that you've, uh, that you've learned? I think probably trying to get a focus on the positive. You know, we use a, a phrase in our kind of team meetings, you know, when we do a kind of round around the table, you know, what went well? Because try, trying to create a, a mindset where you're always looking to make an improvement, you're always looking to make a positive change. So that's not to say that, you know, all the time everything is going well. But then you have different mechanisms for deal with, dealing with the things which aren't going so well. You know, what, what challenges have you got? Right, let's deal with the challenges. But I think trying to create a culture where the, the overarching aim is to make an improvement. So you're looking for what's going well, you know, and kind of calling out what's going well and celebrating what's going well and looking to get more of what's going well. And, you know, trying to identify you know, the green shoots of something which you're, you're starting to, you're trying to make work, but, you know, you until you see the evidence of it, some people won't be kind of convinced. So I think that emphasis on the positive, you know, you, you, you're at work to try to make a difference. You're, trying, you're there to try to add value. So where is that happening? Call it out. I then asked about how he recommends someone looking for a more managerial role should go about finding one. He emphasised that it doesn't have to be a sudden change. In fact, he said the best way to get into it was to change your mindset from focusing on your own work to being aware of other people's. It could be as simple as shadowing another employee or talking to your team about the work that they're doing, but getting yourself out of your own working bubble is the most important thing. For data scientists, project management is the most likely way in. Offering to lead small two or three person projects and taking up small responsibilities can lead to being in charge of larger operations in the future. So I think um, you know, the, the routine, I would, say, I would say it doesn't have to be kind of what point can you have someone to, to manage I think a better route is the more gradual one, which gives you the greater variety of different types of projects. Some of which could be um, you know, technical projects, but they could be something completely different. It could be, you know, you're organizing an away day for the team or something like that. Anything which sort of takes you away from just organizing your own work into organizing other people's work as well. Um, I think the other bit about going towards management is to seek out uh, mentors who can kind of help you in that process. And I think the, the the trick I would say that can work quite well there is rather than sort of trying to find, you know, one specific mentor and say, you know, please, will you be my mentor for the next five years and meet me once every month? Um, you know, that's, that's one option. But I think the other option is to have a, a wider list of relatively more kind of casual acquaintances where you say, look, I've just seen the way you've done this in a meeting and it just looked really great to me, the way you kind of handle that situation. Would you mind sort of talking to me a bit more about that just for 20 minutes? It's just a one-off. And then you might, you know, that might work really well. You might sort of say, well, that was great. I'd really like to meet that person again in three months' time. Tell them where you're trying to get to in your own kind of career and how can they help. Um, but I think having that sort of idea of rather, I've certainly found that people who I've spoken to before felt a bit put off, put off by the idea of trying to establish a relationship with a mentor so that and then they don't have any mentoring at all. Whereas the idea of relatively more kind of casual one-off, um, you know, catch-ups, with people which sometimes then turn into more of a kind of mentoring relationship is really helpful. But I think to to get into that sort of management space, it's really helpful to have other people who are kind of looking at you from a from a distance in a different kind of context. It can then sort of play back to you. You know, this is how I think you did in that situation. Have you thought about doing it this a different situation a different way? Well it's it's nice to know that there's more than one way in, especially for um, someone who's perhaps a little more introverted like me. Um, you mentioned that when you first joined, you were buddied with someone for three months and um, and then you, you buddied someone else. And I think sort of that kind of shadowing can really, yeah, it can really make you more aware of the, the work that's going on around you and can really help. I think, I, I, think, I generally think it really helps. I think um, there is that bit around um, the, the introversion kind of piece. But, you know, introverted people are, are great uh, observers as well. And I'm somewhere on the kind of cusp, I think, between you know, introverted and extroverted. Um, but I think to 
that, that's where the, the mentoring bit can really help because you get that other kind of view. And it could be somebody from who's got you know a ton more experience in, in one context or another. But they can really sort of help you to see things in a different kind of in a different kind of light, in a different way, and, and and it's that level of support as well. While data science and machine learning are great buzzwords, there are some that are rightfully still sceptical about the benefits that they can have uh, by working with data. So we spoke about the impact Simon has seen through the use of data and how it's affected WBA as a whole. In, in multiple markets, you know, obviously the UK, but Republic of Ireland, um, Mexico, Chile, Norway, Thailand, Korea, a little bit in China, we've been able to kind of um, basically analysis that we've done in, in the UK, we've been able to recreate that with data from those markets, which we've kind of um, piped to, to us, rerun the algorithms on them. We've been able to make a kind of um, a prediction as to what effect that's going to have. We've been able to you know, encourage and coach um, a team in another market to actually land things in exactly the way that we say they should be landed. And it's, you know, and that can be, you know, for example, we did a, a trial in, in Houston, Texas for, for Walgreens. So 15 shops, and we changed the space mix in those shops. So the number of things you're actually recommending is quite high. You know, we want two feet less of this, three feet more of that, etc. So it's very specific. And then making a prediction that that's going to make a 15% difference um, to then see that, you know, versus control, that is what you get across those 15 stores, you get that 15% difference. Feels absolutely phenomenal because, you know, it feels like you're doing it by remote control. You know, you're sitting here in the UK, never having been to these places before. All you've got is the data, the algorithms, and your experience of having seen it done. With the, the COVID crisis, a lot of like for a lot of retailers, you know, the emphasis suddenly goes on to their kind of um, dot-com business. And our dot-com business was fed its stock by one warehouse, which normally could, could cope with that level of demand. But with the COVID crisis, it, it couldn't, or the risk was it wasn't going to be able to cope with that level of demand. So we were asked at very short notice to pull together some data in just the right kind of way to inform where should we be specifically in the back shops of which of our existing big stores should we be stocking specific products so those back shops could act as a sort of temporary warehouse. So we did that pretty quickly from some of the data sets we already had, pulled it together in a way which we'd, we'd never done before. And that then formed the basis for the approach of you know, re restocking Boots.com such that we could kind of get through the COVID crisis. And there was a, a huge uplift in Boots.com sales I'm sure for lots of other retailers, dot-com businesses. Um, so, you know, precisely how big was our impact on that? Don't know, but it was certainly very positive. Um, and, you know, so typically the things you know, we'll be measuring are, well, you know, is it a, um, ultimately, is it a sales and profit improvement? Um, un beneath that, well, how many customers, how many how do extra customers have we brought in? What's been the average transaction value? And what's the average item value in the order? All those sorts of measures, but fundamentally as a business, it comes, you know, we're kind of looking to um, improve the experience to our customers or our patients and the way we can monitor that. Ultimately, if we're doing that successfully, that will, you know, relate to a rise in sales and profit. But there are, there are some um, things that we do, obviously, as a company where it's not about sales and profit, it's just about the, the broader impact we can have on our kind of customer base. Another industry problem in the data science community is the concept of the last mile which focuses on the deployment of models and gaining insights from them in order to enact change. Simon said that, as you might expect, they're always checking their models to see if they're still working as intended and not falling victim of model drift, which is where changing circumstances can cause inaccurate predictions unless you update the model to reflect these new circumstances. He then touched on the importance of turning your one-off analysis into a tool that can be used by others. And I think, you know, the, the other aspect of the last mile piece is the around the way we're deploying analytics. So in the, in the past, to some degree, some of our analytics were kind of um, restricted in terms of how many people could access them. So particularly thinking around, you know, space, space analytics, we'd create tools which were very um, sophisticated, but they could only really be used by a handful of people within my team because they had various kind of nuances that, you know, the user had to remember this and remember that and remember the other. Um, and in the last year or so, we've, we've built an application for the space app, for example, which takes all of that kind of thing into account, packages it all up. And it's currently um, in test use in the US with our colleagues in, in Walgreens. And we're looking to use it in, in 
the UK as well. <clears throat> but it will mean that you know people in my, my team don't have to stay as close <clears throat> to the actual deployment of those um, answers. <laughs> because a lot of the complexity has been sort of then taken out, smoothed over and dealt with properly. So I think that's the other aspect of the last mile, that you want to get to a point where your data science is actually embedded in something which can be used by non-data scientists, but, but in a way which is kind of safe. You know, there's not going to be any sort of hidden pitfalls. If anyone's either interested in their first data science role or looking for a data science position on Simon's team, he encouraged potential candidates to get in contact. I would, I would recommend anybody, if they want to, if they think they might be interested in working within my team, um, I would really welcome that. And I would say, you know, connect to me on, on LinkedIn. Let me know where, where you've come from, what kind of things you're interested in. Um, depending on how many people are interested, you know, we can sort of set up a, a group discussion where we can kind of talk about the kind of work we've done and are doing. Um, you know, we're really keen to kind of um, you know, to help to bring people into data science to get that real kind of um, diversity. Um, so, yeah. I'd be really keen to hear from anybody who, who was interested. And, I, you know, I would say this, but, you know, I do think it's a fantastic place to work. As well as this, he mentioned that Boots are currently looking for both internships, mid-level and senior roles in data science. Thanks for listening to this episode of Data Basic. And thank you again to Simon Prynne for giving us some of his time to share his experience. Links to any specific articles mentioned will be in the episode notes. And be sure to check out some of the more bonus content released on our socials over at LinkedIn and Facebook. Next episode, we talk about art, specifically the value of computer-generated art. Not its monetary value, but intrinsically. Can we compare it to human art? Do people react the same way? Find out next time. I'll see you then.